Hello, I'm Patricia, and this is the Poetry P podcast. Over the next few weeks, I want to talk to you about Haikai, Onkodori, and Honzetsu. I hope these chats are going to inspire you to write for the opening prompt of 2024, which I'm calling Illusion, but it's so much more than that. You'll need to stick with me for the next three podcasts to know what I'm looking for. If you're coming to this late, don't worry. I think the content of these podcasts are going to help you to write haiku that might be published by Poetry P in the future, but you could equally well offer them to other publications who specialise in the English language Japanese short form, as well as those in the mainstream. Now, before I start the workshop, I do have a bit of housekeeping. As I record this podcast in November 2023, I have on my desk the submissions for Zoka, which I'm putting into the final journal for the year. I really hope Richard Tice and I can get the journal proofread and out by the end of this year. And of course, those of you on the mailing list will get to know first. So please make sure you're on it. You can sign up on the website. I also need to submit Poetry P's nominations for the Touchstone Awards. You still have one last chance to be considered. The November video prompt on the YouTube channel is available for poetry. Just leave your poems in the comments and Linda will read them. Don't worry. Now we're going to take a break from reading submissions in December because there's so much other work to do for the podcast. Please do continue to listen. One of the episodes will contain those nominations for various awards. But other than that, I think I've got lots of poetry to inspire you to write and a little bit of knowledge to impart too. Now, as I said, I want over the next few weeks to focus on illusion, haikai, honkadori, and honzetsu. I specifically want to focus on the type of poetry we write, English language, Japanese-inspired short form. But before we get to that, I think it's important to think about its evolution. This poetry we write has a long, long history. Some might disagree with me, almost certainly. But I propose it evolves from the waka poetry of the ancients. Perhaps it's a good idea to clearly define what I mean by waka. Today I want to use the word to refer to the short poem that many traditionally know as a 31-syllable poem that was central to Japanese poem from the 700s through to the 1900s, and arguably evolved to become what we now know as Tanka. But we'll be looking at Tanka in more detail in another podcast. So let's do a very simplistic evolution. We'll go into it in more detail as we work through this year, but I'm proposing that Waka leads to a form of Renga, or linked verse, which at least at the beginning of the form, a minimum of two people would write, one taking the first three lines, the other, the final two. The opening verse of the Renga, that is, the Hoku, emerged as the verse we might more easily recognise today as Haiku. And from the time of Shiki, of course, we have the Haiku, a standalone verse, which traditionalists see as a 17-syllable verse, but as we know in contemporary English language Haiku, that tradition has been, shall we say, somewhat abandoned? on the basis that you can't really translate the Japanese on on G as an English syllable. I've spoken about that in the past, and I'm sure I'm going to return to it. So along the evolutionary way, the idea of haikai emerged. And today I want to take a look at that, what it is, why it's important to us, because I think haikai goes to the root of what we write today as English language Japanese-inspired short-form poetry. To start, I'm going to quote from Haruo Shirane. Haiku is both a specific poetic genre and a particular mode of discourse, an attitude towards language, literature, and tradition. It's an unorthodox poem. Some say you can already glimpse this genre emerging in the Manyoshu which is deemed to be the oldest anthology of classical Japanese poetry and dates from around AD 759. 
In the early days, poets would write these unorthodox poems with humour, wit and wordplay. But those contained within Manyoshu would have been written in the classical style. The words would have been those of educated courtiers from the imperial court, using the prescribed language of the classical style. As the haikai genre grew and evolved through waka and renga over the centuries, it diverted from the traditional. No longer were poets forbidden to use language of the vernacular, that is, everyday language. The idea of haikai words transpired. Haikai words, then, are words of everyday life. Poetry became accessible to a wider populace. It was written by a larger number of people, and these new poets were often from classes lower than the poets of the imperial court. Peasants like me sometimes. Possibly because of that, possibly because it was often written in company, in a competitive way, and with the imbibing of alcohol, this unorthodox poetry was often bawdy or vulgar in nature. And let me give you this poem attributed to Ikkyo Sojun, written around 1037. In this world of ours, we eat and we defecate, we sleep and get up, and after all of this, well, all that's left is to die. In this world of ours, we eat and we defecate, we sleep and get up, and after all of this, well, all that's left is to die. I can't help but feel it could be a little bit more vulgar, but maybe that's just my mind. And from the Dog Tsukuba collection, which was an anthology of 1532, we have this one. It begins with a robe of mist soaked at the hem, the opening two lines. And then, because it was a renga, someone else, Sokan in this instance, wrote the final three lines. Princess Saho, with the coming of spring, stands pissing. A robe of mist soaked at the hem, Princess Saho, with the coming of spring, stands pissing. Now this princess was a reference back to classical literature. Traditionally, she'd be written about as standing in a spring mist, which would become her robe. But as we can see from this example, Haikai of the 16th century combined the classical with some lewd language. By the 1500s, however, questions were being asked by poets as to the quality of these poems, which were now often seen as distinct from the renga from which they came. These haikai verses had become quite coarse, as we can see from this example. One of the poets questioning the quality of this poetry was Arakida. Moritake, born in 1473 and lived till 1549, he wrote this verse, which we probably all know in some form or other. A fallen petal back to its bough reviewed, a butterfly. A fallen petal back to its bough reviewed, a butterfly. Now, Moritake was acknowledged to be a pioneer of Haikai no Renga. Writing in about 1508, he asked, In Haikai, is the purpose to make people laugh for no reason? And he went on to say, Haikai should deal with both appearance and reality and be refined. Furthermore, a verse should be genuine, yet humorous. Is it sounding familiar yet? Moritake, although wanting a more refined poetry, does acknowledge that he'd like to keep the tone of this haikai poetry light. Now, moving forward, in the 17th century, Matsunaga Taitoku 
founder of the Taimon School, further developed Moritake's idea of refinement of haikai poetry. He was a waka poet and classical literature teacher, and he advocated for haikai poetry. He wanted poetry to be accessible, but he wanted to improve its image. He wanted to move it away from the vulgar, indelicate poetry to a more respectable, refined form. And to this end, he encouraged his disciples to use Chinese words and vernacular Japanese and to remove crude words and phrases from the prescribed haikai words. In 1643, in the new mongrel Tsukuba collection, that's quite hard to say, Taitoku revised the robe of mist poem that we heard a minute ago. And this is his version. A robe of mist soaked at the hem, heavenly creatures descending it seems. The Sea of Spring. A robe of mist soaked at the hem, heavenly creatures descending it seems. The Sea of Spring. It's definitely more respectable, isn't it? Well, I can't help feeling that I like the other one a little bit better. That probably says more about me than the poetry. So anyway, this Taimon school were not the only school of Haikai in the 1600s, and of course not the only ones with opinions on the Haikai form. And as the influence of the Taimon school waned in the second half of the 1600s, the Dan Rin school came to the fore. The Dan Rin had a diametrically opposed idea from that of the Taimon. They wanted to return to the light, witty, scatological style of the pre-Taimon Haikai. A follower of the Taimon school said of the Danrin verses that they are only puns in the worst sense and are as light and as worthless as pumice stones. So you can see there was a bit of aggro between the two schools. But of course now we're in Basho's time and his approach to Haikai was going to be critical to ours, to the English language short form, because we hold him up as one of the masters rightly or wrongly, often the primary master of the haikai form, which we aspire to write today. Now, he's born in 1644 and he died in 1694, which was an important juncture in the evolution of haikai. The time on school, of which he was a devotee in his early haikai days, was on the wane, and Dan Rin was on the rise. And... On moving to Edo, the city we now know as Tokyo, when he was 29, Bashu came under the influence of the Danrin school. So what do we know of Bashu's thoughts on Haikai? He felt that in the poetry of Haikai, ordinary words should be used. Now that doesn't mean that we just choose any old word and throw it into a poem. No, he wanted that we should not be careless with our words. Choose carefully. He felt that Haikai broadened the scope of what was then known as Hoku. There was no topic that was not suitable for Hoku and by extension Haiku that we write today. He also thought that we should be free to use humour and lightness of touch in our verses, and that Haikai needed to forge bonds with the traditional arts, to draw authority and inspiration from the earlier poets of Japan and China, and to find a larger philosophical or spiritual base. And you'll be pleased to know that Bashu felt everything is fair game for inclusion in Haikai poetry. So what do we see from this? I think we see that Basho was, in effect, fairly conservative in his approach, perhaps echoing the time on school by wanting to write unorthodox poems in a more refined way. He felt inspiration could come from earlier poetic works, and we know that he was not prone to vulgarity. Of course, that's not the end of Haikai evolution, developments and thought. 
possibly people would say that Isa was a far more accomplished poet of Haikai style, if you take into account his use of irreverence, contemporary language and, and levity. Shall we have a look at some of his poems? If you are kindly, they will shit all over you, happy young sparrows. If you are kindly, they will shit all over you, happy young sparrows. And perhaps this also shows us a bit of an allegorical Zen style too. In a bitter wind they wait, two bits per trick, outside a whore's shack. In a bitter wind they wait, two bits per trick, outside a whore's shack. Shall we have one more? Let's. Let's do that. Chrysanthemum blooms. Even the stench of urine succumbs to its perfume. Chrysanthemum blooms. Even the stench of urine succumbs to its perfume. So there you go. A little trio of poems from Kobayashi Isa. Translated by Sam Hamill. Now, surely today, what we're hoping to achieve with our haiku, whether we use the 575 or the more contemporary English language form, is haikai, the unorthodox poem. Whether it's through the use of humour, contemporary language, illusion, contemporary pop culture, a broad range of topics, remember? Anything's fair game. An unusual perspective. Or all the above. That's why the understanding of Haikai is important to us. Because it's a guide to what we aspire to achieve in our unorthodox poems. We're looking for something unusual, aren't we? Anyway, keep this checklist handy. You'll need it for January submissions. So, thank you very much for joining me today. Join me next time for haiku using illusion or honkadori. It's one of those techniques that Basho felt to be important and one he used. And if it's good enough for a haiku master, I reckon it's probably good enough for us. What do you think? Well, it's been fun putting this together for you. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to read the short essay that accompanies this week's podcast, you'll find a link in the show notes. If you have a few spare coppers, perhaps you'll be able to donate when you download them. Or maybe you'd like to buy us a coffee. I could do with a bit of financial help to keep the podcast going. Anyway, I look forward to being with you next week to have a listen to more inspirational haiku through the ages. And not just haiku, actually. But until then, keep writing. And if I've missed something in the show notes, just email me and I'll put it right. Ciao!